Hi everybody, I hope this video finds you well. In today's video, we're going to be continuing on with our discussion about the one sample proportion procedures that we uh, introduced in the previous video by looking at another example. So let's jump right in and take a look at this. So for this example, we're going to suppose you work for a candidate who is running for mayor of a small city with around 50,000 registered voters. So you want to study if a majority of the voters plan on voting for your candidate. So to study this, what you do is you randomly select 10 blocks from your city and interview all the registered voters who live on those blocks. So you end up interviewing 280 registered voters. You find that 160 of these voters plan on voting for your candidate. So just to sort of recap what we're, how we sort of built this study, what we did is we randomly selected 10 blocks. We talked to everybody who lived on those 10 blocks, which ended up being 280 people. And out of those 280, 160 said that they plan on voting for our candidate. So what are we going to do in this example? Well, we're just going to run through all the things that we sort of introduced in the previous video. We're going to eventually talk about running a hypothesis test and building a confidence interval. But before we do that, we're going to talk about what type of sampling technique was used to build uh, this sample. Then we're going to carry out the hypothesis test to test the claim that a majority of voters in the city plan on voting for our candidate. And then we'll build a 95% confidence interval for the percentage of voters in this city who plan on voting for our candidate. And then finally, we'll do a little bit of error analysis by deciding that if we say, um, if we decide that a majority of voters plan on voting for our candidate when they really do not, uh, would this be a type one or type two error? So let's jump right in and start by talking about the sampling technique. So for part A here, we want to figure out what type of sampling was used. Now, as we know, we have sort of four major types of valid uh, statistical sampling. We've got our SRS, our stratified, our cluster, and systematic. The key thing you have to see here is that our random selection was of the city blocks. We selected 10 blocks, but the blocks were not our individuals. Our individuals were these registered voters. So while we only selected 10 blocks, we ended up with 280 individuals. Remember, whenever your individuals uh, is much larger than the number of selections, that indicates a cluster sample. And that's exactly what the technique is here. This is a cluster sample. And cluster samples should make sense, right? What we did is we only selected 10 blocks, but there's tons of people who live on each block, and it ended up giving us 280 individuals. Keep in mind here that clusters were the city blocks. Okay, so we've got an example of cluster sampling here. All right, now let's move on to our hypothesis test. So we wanted to do a hypothesis test to test the claim that a majority of voters plan on voting for our candidate. Well, uh, is this going to be a one sample proportion hypothesis test? Well, certainly you should be convinced that it is a proportion hypothesis test. There is no mention of means or standard deviations. The variable we're looking at is, do you plan on voting for our candidate? That is a yes or no question. So it makes sense that we are doing this as a proportional analysis. Do we only have one sample? Yep, that makes sense. We had uh, we took those 280 people, so we have only got one sample here. So we've got our one sample proportion hypothesis test. All right, so we can go in and start with our hypotheses. So since it's a one sample proportion hypothesis test, our null is going to be p equals some value, and our alternate is going to be p with some inequality and the same value. So let's see if we can find our null hypothesis. Remember, the null hypothesis is usually a known or assumed percentage. So if we read through this, right, there's no mention of a known or assumed percentage. So unfortunately, we've got to get the null in a little bit of a different way here. Let's look at our claim. Our claim is that we're trying to claim that a majority of voters plan on voting for our candidate. So let's think about what this means, right? If you have a majority right? If you have a majority of votes, that means you have more than 50%, right? A majority means you have more than half. So this majority tells us what our alternate hypothesis is going to be. The alternate hypothesis we're going to use is that we think the percentage that's going to vote for our candidate is greater than 50%. So our alternate in this case is going to be greater than 0.50. Now, even though it wasn't mentioned as a known or assumed 
percentage, if we're using 0.50 as the value, then that has to be our null hypothesis. So a little bit different than some of the previous ones where we usually find the null first, but just keep in mind here that we're using the claim in this case, which mentioned majority. We know majority means more than 50%, so we use that to fill in the alternate, and we know the same value has to go here and here, so once we get this guy, then we know this has to be the same. In the past, we would call this a one-sided test. We'll be a little bit more specific here since we are doing greater than. We will call this a right-sided test. Keep in mind that it, since it is a right-sided test, when we go to get the p-value, table A, which is what we're going to be using because this is a proportional hypothesis test, table A always tells us what's to the left. Since we're going to want the stuff that's to the right, we're going to need to do 1 minus that. All right, let's go ahead and do our conditions then here. For our conditions, the first one is that it's random and representative, and that is stated. Cluster is a valid way of doing this. The second one is we need to make sure that our sample size is less than 5% of our population size. Well, our sample size, we know that we ended up talking to 280 registered voters, and we actually do know our population size here as well, at least approximately. We know that it's around 50,000. So let's go ahead and check. N equals 280, is that less than 0 0.05 times 50,000? Well, if you do 0 0.05 times 50,000, you'll see that that comes out as 2,500. And 280 is less than 2,500, so we're all good with that. For condition three, this is that one where we actually check that the normal distribution is a fair approximation to the binomial. So we need to do NP1 minus P. That's going to be 280 times 0 0.50 because our null is 0 0.50 and then 1 minus 0 0.50. Multiply all that together and you should get 70 and that is greater than or equal to 10. So we're all good with that. All right, we can go ahead then and move on to our test statistic since all of our conditions are actually met here. It's going to be a Z test statistic because there's no need to do any estimating of a population standard deviation. Formula here is going to be p hat minus p over the square root p1 minus p divided by n. Three things we need to know, p hat, p, and n. We've mentioned a couple of these. We already know the null hypothesis p is going to be 0 0.50, and we know that the n is 280. We just need to find out our sample proportion. In other words, we need to figure out what proportion or percentage in our sample planned on voting for our candidate. So if we look back here, we saw that we talked to 280 people and 160 said that they planned on voting for our candidate. So we would do this as 160 divided by 280. We pop that into our calculator, taking 160 dividing by 280. And you should see that that comes out as about 0.571. So about 57.1% of people in our sample said that they plan on voting for our candidate. Now our question is, is this far enough above 50% to really believe that this is going to be true for the entire population of the town? So let's go ahead and calculate that test statistic then. So we'll go ahead and we'll pull this up here. So Z then is going to be 0.571, that's our P hat, minus 0.50, that's our null divided by the square root 0 0.50, 1 minus 0 0.50, all divided by 280. As normal, we'll go ahead and do the top and bottom separately. Up top, we'll get 0.071. In the denominator, we'll get square root 0 0.50 times 1 minus 0 0.50, divided by 280. And after you round that to three decimal places, you should get 0 0.030. Then we can go ahead and do our division, 0.071 divided by 0 0.030, and you should get about 2.37 there. All right, now we're ready to go ahead and get our p-value. So keep in mind, we can go ahead and draw it out if we want to. The middle is where our assumption is, which is our null hypothesis. Z being 2.37, that's a positive z-score, so that's somewhere over here. So there's z equals 2.37. We are interested in the chance that we would be above this. So that means our p-value, the shaded area, is going to be this stuff over here. Let's go ahead and look this value up on table A, which is, of course, the one that corresponds to the z, the normal distribution. So we're looking up 
So if we do that, uh, there's 2.3, 2.30, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So it looks like we should have this guy right here, 0.9911. So let's go ahead and record that. So we got 0.9911. So when we looked up on table A, 0.9911. Remember, table A always tells us what's to the left, so that's 0.9911. Is 0.9911 our p-value? Well, no, because it's to the left, and our p-value is the stuff to the right. So in this case, our p-value is actually equal to 1 minus 0.9911 which is gonna be 0 0.0089. So our p-value is 0 0.0089, about 0.89%. Let's go ahead and make our conclusion then. If we take this p-value and we compare it against alpha's 0 0.05, again, if you prefer to think in percentages, this is 5%, this is 0.89%. Clearly the p-value is smaller. So we have a small p-value here. So we know we will be rejecting HO. So if you think back here, we're throwing out that null hypothesis. We are going with our claim that the percentage of people who plan on voting for our candidate is above 50%. In other words, we do have evidence that our candidate has the majority of support. So significant evidence that the majority of voters plan on voting for our candidate. So there we go. So in other words, if we want our candidate to win, this is a good sign, right? This study has given us evidence to believe that they are on track to win. Now, of course, uh, there could be issues with how we gathered the data. I mean, how did we figure out that these people planned on voting for our candidate? But at least according to the data that we have here, we are convinced that this is not just, you know, within normal variation of a split race. This is a good sign that they really are carrying a majority of the support. All right. So this is our second example of running a one sample proportion hypothesis test. The big computational difference this time that you should compare against the example from the previous video was that this was a right-sided test. So when we had to do that p-value, we had to do one minus what we saw on table A to actually get our p-value. Let's go ahead and take this a step further and build a 95% confidence interval so we actually know how much or what percentage of support our candidate actually has. So let's go ahead and do that on our next page here. So this will be part C here. So for part C, we'd like to do a 95% confidence interval for percent of voters who plan on voting for our candidate. Well, we've got to go to our, we know that this is going to be a one sample proportion confidence interval. How do we know that? Well, because we are trying to estimate a single percentage based on a single sample of binomial slash Boolean categorical data. So this is going to be a one sample proportion confidence interval. So let's look at our conditions. We know that we will have a different condition three to check. These guys are already checked, so we're good there. For condition three, right, we need to check the successes and the failures. So what was the amount of successes? Well, if we look back, we talked to 280 voters and we found that 160 supported our candidate. So the successes would be 160. That is greater than or equal to 10. So we're all good. For the failures, well, anybody who said they weren't planning on voting for our candidate is counted as a failure here. There were 280 people, 160 said yes. That means 280 minus 160, which is 120, must have said no. So the failures here was 120, which is also greater than or equal to 10, so we're all good. Then we can move on to our construction. So keep in mind our construction here, p hat plus or minus z star square root p hat one minus p hat over n. So three things we need to know here, that sample proportion, the sample size, and that Z star. Sample proportion we already calculated, that was 160 out of 280, which came out as about 0.571. The N is 280. And the Z star, well, remember this we will just grab from table C. We've got our 95% confidence. We've got our Z star, 
If you remember, though, we did an example in the previous video with 95% in Z-star, and it came out as 1.96. We expect the same thing here because there are no degrees of freedom. So let's go ahead and grab that. All right? There's our 95%. Let's zoom out a little bit. A little bit more. 95% Z-star. That gives us 1.960, just like last time, because again, no degrees of freedom. So Z star, anytime you're doing 95% confidence, going to be 1.960. So we got 1.960. So we'll record that, 1.960. Let's throw everything in there. 1.571 plus or minus 1.960 square root 0.571. 1 minus 0.571 divided by 280. As always, we'll go ahead and we'll get our margin of error component first. So we will do 1.960 times the square root, 0.571 times 1 minus 0.571 divided by 280. Again, if you just type it in with those parentheses, you'll be all good in one line. And we should get here a margin of error of about 0.058. All right, then we go ahead, do our subtraction first, so 0.571 minus 0.058. Then we should get 0.513 at the lower end and 0.571 plus 0.058, 0 0.629. All right, when we go to interpret that, let's write that in terms of percentages. So we are 95% confident that between... 51.3% and 62.9% of voters in our city plan on voting for our candidate. Now, notice that this, again, matches up with what we saw in the hypothesis test. In the hypothesis test, we threw out the null hypothesis of 0.50 or 50%, and notice that 50% is not in the range of percentages that we consider believable. Again, keep in mind, in our data, 57% of people said that they were going to vote for our candidate. We're saying that we don't necessarily believe it has to be exactly 50%, 57%. We think it could be as low as only 51%, but it could also be as high as about 63%. In other words, again, we sort of are saying we're pretty confident here with our interval that our candidate does have a majority of support, either just barely with about 51%, all the way up to a very wide margin of about 63%. All right. Let's wrap this up with one discussion of a error. So for part D, it said if you decide your candidate has majority when they do not, is this going to be type 1 or type 2? So let's focus on this part here, the actual decision that we would make. So if we decide your candidate has the majority, well, let's go back to our hypotheses. If we reject the null, we're throwing this out and going with this. Going with this means that we think the percentage is above 50%, which means that we think that there's a majority. So to decide that there's a majority, we have to reject the null. That means if we do that in error, if we decide our candidate has the majority when they really do not, well, then this would be where we rejected HO, but HO is actually true. So this would be reject HO when they do not, when in reality HO is true. So the type of error you make if you reject HO or the type of error that you can potentially make when you reject HO would be a type 1 here. So this would be a type 1 error. So, a, and again, remember type 1 error, false positives. That is what this sounds like, right? This is where you report to your boss, the candidate. You're going to, you have a majority. You're going to win this election. They really don't. That's a false positive. That is a type 1 error. In our next video, we'll do one more example of this one sample proportion hypothesis test, and then we'll be ready to wrap up this section and start to move into two sample proportion procedures.